forward. All right. Um, so, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our ALA session, ALA 2021. Our panel is called Eudora Welty and the Body. I'm Dr. Annette Trefser. I teach in the English department at the University of Mississippi, and I have the honor and the pleasure um, to serve as current president of the Eudora Welty Society. So welcome everyone. Our panel, um, Welty and the Body, returns to a classic topic in Welty studies. If we needed a starting point, we could begin two decades ago, for instance, with a 2002 conference held in Rennes, France. The proceedings, Eudora Welty and the Poetics of the Body, appeared as volume five in the series Etude Pochnerienne in 2005. It is a volume edited by our French colleagues, Géraldine Chouard and the late Daniel Pitavisouk. 22 contributors, esteemed scholars of Southern literature on both sides of the Atlantic gathered to discuss Welty's photographic body, body languages in her literature, the body of or as the other, Welty's writing and the body politic, as well as her creation of embodied memory. In her introduction, Schwartz cites Nietzsche's belief that, quote, there is more sense in your body than in the essence of wisdom itself. And she suggests that Welty was wise to the affects and effects of this insight and thus developed a true, quote, philosophy of the body in the sense that the body constitutes a world in itself, the primary system of reference. So the signifying power of the body in Welty's fiction continues to be of central interest in more recent scholarship, such as Harriet Pollack's Eudora Welty, Fiction and Photography, The Body of the Other Woman. And it is the topic of our session today, where we approach Welty's representations of the physical and the psychological, the organic and the metaphorical, the mute and the speaking body the living and the dead body. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers in the order of the program. Our first speaker today is Stephen Fuller. Steve is professor of English at Middle Georgia State University. His book, Eudora Welty and Surrealism, investigates modernist strategies of interiority in Welty through the 1950s. And I've been told that his current research focuses on the remaining decades of her career, years that witnessed the enlarged role of her fiction and how, um, how that fiction assigns to spoken language as an ideological force in Southern culture. His paper will be our first, and it is titled Eudor Welty, Performativity and the Speaking Body. Our second speaker is Sarah Ford at Baylor University where she is professor of American literature and she also directs the Be All, am I saying this right? Beale Poetry Festival. She's the author most recently of Haunted Property, Slavery and the Gothic came out in 2020 and Tracing Southern Storytelling in Black and White. She also serves as the web editor of the Eudora Welty Society's website. Thank you, Sarah. So let's get started first with um, Steve Fuller and I turn over the program um, to Steve. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I've slightly revised the title of my paper uh, to the speaking body and Lacanian performativity in Eudora Welty's Shower of Gold. A wide angled appreciation of the literary and photographic output of Eudora Welty reveals a lifelong interrogation of forms of consciousness that arise from the experience of embodied beings shaped by networks of cultural discourse. <clears throat> by embodied, I assume body theorist Carrie Nolan's 2014 definition in agency and embodiment when she identifies the process whereby collective behaviors and beliefs acquired through acculturation are rendered individual and lived at the level of the body. To date, the most far-reaching examination of this notion 
of the Body and Welty Studies comes from Harriet Pollock, who in her 2016 Eudora Welty's Fiction and Photography, The Body of the Other Woman, theorizes an emancipatory project at work in the presence of the body of the other woman in Welty. The bodies of self-confident black women in her photographs and the audacious working class white women in her stories, Pollock writes, demonstrate a woman artist who creates through her identification with a community of other women. While Jay Watson's reading for the body had in 2012 generally called for Southern studies to carry out this kind of work, number four Pollock had so completely recognized the significance of the women's bodies of all sorts that proliferate in Welty or underlined the reassessment of cultural programming that the representations of the body imply. Here too, I adopt Pollock's vision of Welty as cultural reformist, but focus my analyses almost exclusively on acts of speech, which I recognize as inherently embodied and as central to the understanding of Welty's career in its second half. While some body theorists like Noland argue corporeal signifying as restricted to speechless gestures, other, others like music scholar Michel Dunn allow that singers are no less gestural and no less material. And the latter critic I follow here because the voice of speech, like the voice of song, from the lungs to the vocal cords, from the glottis to the nasal tract, from the alveolar ridge to the soft palate, from the hard palate to the tongue and from the teeth to the lips, demands the body's cooperation in its production. Furthermore, neuroscientist Matthew Rouse notes recent inquiry in the areas of speech and audiology that confirm the idea that kinesthetic awareness or bodily awareness function along with auditory awareness in order to regulate speech. Citing a 2006 study published in the periodical Biology, Rouse goes on to observe, the brain also uses somatosensory information to achieve the precision needed in speech and that kinesthesia, which is the brain's awareness of the position and movement of the articulators through sense organs embedded in muscles called proprioceptors, generates information that the brain processes in order to give speech coherence and intelligibility. In short, evidence indicates that speech is also an embodied activity. Intersubjective speech then plays a central role in what follows here and evolves out of my Eudora Weltian surrealism. That book claims the fundamental influence of surrealism as informing Welty's art artistic production from the 30s through the 50s. While the following analysis adds to the contention that in her work from the 50s to its end in the 80s, a new focus emerges, strengthens and solidifies into a major feature in her writing. Put simply and reductively, Welty incrementally substitutes the dreamy and often quiet interior language of political rebellion as, project, uh, political rebellion as projected through the revolutionary aesthetic of surrealism for a language of embodied social protest as protected, projected through a series of narrators conspicuous for their vocality. In my view, this turn toward embodied speech finds its origin partly as a response to critical evaluations of her work that mistakenly intimated her conservatism. Diana Trilling's caustic 1943 and 1946 Nation reviews of the wide net and Delta Wedding represent the shrillest iterations of this complaint. Reacting against her misrepresentation by developing her aesthetic in a new direction, and especially in an era of increasingly increasing civil rights and feminist agitation, while she entered the public sphere loudly and boldly through her speakers. But what action do the embodied vocal performances of her characters enable in relation to languages master signifiers? Those words such as truth, justice, authority, and holiness, which give coherence to discourse. In particular, how do the first and second person narrators in her fictions do things by speaking? How do the speakers carry out some kind of action, some sort of speech, as J.L. Austin, the author of the seminal How to Do Things with Words, would define it through the making of a verbal gesture? In brief, these narrators instate through repeated acts of speech, psychological truths, subjectivizing themselves and others in the same way that speakers who name vessels, I name the ship the Queen Elizabeth, will possessions, I give and bequeath this watch to my brother, enter marriages, I do, and end meetings, this session is adjourned, and grant credentials, I confer this degree, 
establish the truth of their utterance in the delivery of the utterance itself. Austin puts this observation in the following way. In these examples, it seems clear that to utter the sentence is not to describe my doing of what I should be said in so uttering to be doing or to state that I am doing it, it is to do it. Therefore, and perhaps automatically among speakers and listeners, agreement prevails, at least notionally, that performatives create new and acceptable facts. And who disagrees when through speech ships acquire new names, when inheritors inherit, when partners marry, when meetings conclude, and when students graduate? Few, I submit, but specifically to understand the power radiated by master signifiers, this paper now turns directly to the origin of this expression, the psychoanalysis of Jacques Lacan, and especially to his formulation in the late 60s and early 70s of the four discourses. This quartet of contrasting algorithms characterize discourse taken as a social link, Lacan notes in his essay to Jacobson, founded on language. He defines the general assumption through four schemas that in relation to one another locate four discourses, the discourse of the master, the hysteric, the university, and the analyst. These discourses, literary critic Mark Breaker associates with four key social phenomena, educating, governing, protesting, and revolutionizing. Underlying each algorithm, a careful arrangement of terms, agent, other, truth, and production determines critical lines of force and effect. Occupying the top left position in the algorithm, the agent directs its signifying power toward the other, that which or whom the agent desires to control and perhaps pacify, especially because from this tension arises the question of the possession of jouissance, the Lacanian term designating pleasure and enjoyment. Underneath the other and subject to repression, production describes typically disguised and therefore below the bar transactions involving the generating exchange ownership and loss of jouissance. Lacan conspicuously integrates here Karl Marx's concept of surplus value because he desires not only that the position establish a kind of economy of desire, fantasy and enjoyment, but because he wishes to underscore conflict in a social dialectic that involves imposition, exploitation and antagonism. The bottom left position of truth repressed below the bar and less articulated through psychoanalytic processes like therapy, completes the economy of signification, desire and power and expresses along with the three other terms, axiomatic assumptions central to Lacanianism. In addition to the above blend of ideas attributable to theorists such as Noland, Dunn, Austin and Lacan, this paper also regards as central Marx's assertion of species being and in particular Lacan's appropriation of Marx to develop his view of discourse, where Marx in his economic and philosophic manuscripts argues that living in a system of capitalist production inherently alienates humans from their species being, he makes an essentialist argument that Lacan and this paper maintains about human nature, that every human possesses structurally a compulsion to produce through labor, a confirmation of him or herself as what Marx describes as free being. And that, back to Marx here, the object of labor is therefore the objecti objectification of man's species life. For he duplicates himself not only as in consciousness, intellectually, but also actively in reality. And therefore he contemplates himself in a world that he has created. For Marx though, subordination to capitalist conditions alienates labor which subjects by and large must sell in order to survive and therefore alienates people from each other and their species being, or what he calls their essential being, such that labor is already not voluntary, but coerced, it is forced labor. And that alien character emerges clearly in the fact that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shunned like the plague. One might think of the millions who spend their hours working for the weekend. Social philosopher Eric Fromm helpfully glosses this cornerstone of Marx's critique of capitalism in the following way. For Marx, as for Hegel, the concept of alienation is based on the distinction between existence and essence, and on the fact that man's existence is alienated from his essence, that in reality he is not what he potentially is, or to put it differently, 
he is not what he ought to be, and that he ought to be that which he could be. For Marx, as for Hegel, but also, like I maintain here, for Marx, as for Lacan, when put into conversation with theorists of the body, like Noland and Dunn, and theorists of speech, like Austin, possession of a human body implies ownership of structures that affirm in ideal circumstances labor as an action that generates what Fromm designates as the emancipation of the human being through the restitution of the unalienated and hence free activity of all men and the society in which man and not the production of things is the aim. In many of Welty's narratives, the suspension of characters in various repressive ideologies co-ops their bodies and seems to determine a loss of control over their freedom. Think of Jenny in At the Landing, Edna Earle in The Ponder Harp, or Gloria in Losing Battles. Nonetheless, language use as a form of embodied action has the performative ability to affect the ongoing production of subjectivity and therefore holds out the promise of increased liberation. Sometimes utterances of Welty's characters perform speech acts of obedience and conformity. They employ the Lacanian discourse of the master slash university because they reinforce existing distributions of power. But on other occasions, their speech inexplicably revolts. They employ the discourse of the analyst slash hysteric against normative assumptions. I claim here under the influence of Noland that perhaps the embodiment, the embodiment of speech itself, its kinesthetic quality forces a disruption and a possible revision of received narratives. Some of the speaking bodies represented by Welty's range of orators like sister in why i live at the po or the narrator of a memory display what theologist ryan lamoth designate, designates as somatic agency the expression he offers to describe nascent subjectivity that is rooted in the body where an embryonic sense of agency is originally somatic agency the pre-verbal and unconscious capacity to move and exert power this seemingly christaven and thus choric sense of a pre-inscribed moment can become a zone of what she describes in revolution and poetic language as sensory stimulation, sensory stimulation produced for the self and a field of reflexivity in which the subject becomes an object of her own awareness. However, Welty seems to contend that for figures like Katie Rainey, the narrator of Shower of Gold, little promise of liberation stirs because Katie scarcely demonstrates any kinesthetic awareness of her speaking body and therefore cannot claim ownership over this essential aspect of her identity. In other words, Welty depicts in the opening movement of the Golden Apples, an alienated speaker, almost completely subject to the authority of the discourse of the master and university, and whose monologue practically never questions the place that the symbolic order regulating the social hierarchies of Morgana has allocated to her. Although Peter Schmidt, Peter Schmidt's account of this narrative underscores the agency that Katie illustrates, including her among the women who have moved from being the behind the scenes initiators of the action to controlling how those actions are interpreted. Critics such as Gail Mortimer, Sally Wolf and Rebecca Mark show more conservatism. Mark, for example, concludes her survey noting that Katie cannot move beyond conjecture, anger and self-conscious speculation and that she remains too trapped within her day-to-day -day existence to be able to see the full extent of women's oppression. And Wolf concludes hers by observing that Katie's talking and visioning compensate in part for her own unrealized dreams. I sympathize here with the circumspection of Mark and Wolf because Katie's monologue, despite its frequent celebrations of Snowdy, a woman who does not completely accept her culture's paternalism, still capitulates in its unconscious reinforcement of patriarchal control. For instance, the story begins with a reflexive concession to dominant cultural values when she seems to confess her vulnerability to mimicking ideas that supposed superiors suggest she absorb. What King did, the copycats might always do. Her propensity to uncritically imitate social convention ensures her integration into a regional identity and creates a context that legitimizes her submission to King something to which she more or less admits shortly after when she reveals that she met to tryst with King in Morgan's Woods. 
Here, her speech acts to reproduce and authorize one of the many such iterations in her um, oratory, the gender inequality that justifies King's philandering and her consent to, their act, to that action. We would any of us know the place he meant without trying, Katie notes. I could have streaked like an arrow to the very oak tree, one there to itself and all spread. A real shady place by day is all I know. Can't you just see King McLean leaning his length against that tree by the moon as you come walking through Morgan's woods when you hadn't seen him in three years? In evocations such as these, Katie rehearses the discourse of the master slash university with little deviating from the script that positions her as naturally subject to the power of his desire. He comes to her like Zeus to Danae, a moment rendered by classicist Edith Hamilton as a shower of gold that fell from the sky and filled her chamber. The frequently hagiographic style and content of Katie's speech in these examples reproduce feminine compliance with masculine order and employs the discourse of the master because it ties master signifiers like truth and authenticity to university knowledge or official knowledge expressed through social institutions such as the legal, political, educational and economic arms of governance in Mississippi. In Shower of Gold and more broadly in the Golden Apples, Welty underlines that adopting the language that articulates this knowledge or what citizens can know about their social arrangement has the effect of instating patriarchal law, signified by the names of Morgana's men, such as King, McLean, Stark, Comus, Vardaman, Zeus, and Fate. There, in this interaction between master signifiers and their culturally determined definitions, Lacanian psychoanalysis argues that the fundamental matrix of the coming to be of the subject through alienation occurs. A process that Lacan describes as the emergence of what we call the subject via the signifier, which as it happens here functions as representing this subject with respect to another signifier. Katie's subjectivity has formed from this point of view at the point where master signifiers come to represent her in relation to official knowledge or more directly, where interpolation bonds signifiers like legitimacy and authority to signifiers like the male names listed above. Subject to the master's authority, Katie's pleasure undergoes redirection. That is her, her jouissance undergoes redirection. The enjoyment that she accumulates as a result of her obedience to the master's knowledge does not remain entirely hers. A portion of it gets drawn off. That surplus, Lacanian Bruce Fink observes, deriving from the activity of the worker is appropriated by the capitalist. And we might suppose that it directly or indirectly procures the capitalist some kind of enjoyment. Object A, the phrase Lacan assigns to items typically part imaginary and part material, giving the illusion of subjects as centered beings remains below the level of consciousness. Before, in the discourse of the university, it rises above the bar where knowledge of the institutional kind determines the acceptable forms in which Katie can find pleasure. Typically, those forms of enjoyment, like her capitulation to King and her distance towards Snowdy, reinforce male authority. Despite Welty's underscoring of the irrationality that marks Katie's and also to a lesser extent Snowdy's allegiance to the patriarchal nature of the symbolic order that alienates them, they both remain subject to its power and consent to its reproduction. Against the influence of the master university discourses though, women like these cannot so easily stage resistance because rejecting the discourses that have formed their subjectivity ris risks rejecting also the structures that supply psychological coherence. In Katie's case, lack of kinesthetic awareness or knowledge of the body as her own possession militates against developing revisions of custom and tradition. I've got a couple more um, pages in there. Can I, can I finish up here or do, do I need sure. to show? I think okay. we have the time. Thank okay. you. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'm, I think I'm about 20 minutes right now. Um, 
the fantasies of male divinity that undergird Katie's acceptance of her assigned gender role in life also penetrate the analysis of socioeconomic class that royalty supplies in Shower of Gold. As shown above, most of Morgana's men determine through their discourse the expectation that women should, women should without complaint accept and even worship their authority as if bestowed by fate. Both Katie and Snowdy in small and large ways follow this orthodoxy, but unlike the latter's, the former's toleration and or support of the narrative that supposes her class inferiority also affects her ability to show agency. Not only did the discourses of the master university determine gendered choices in life, but they also control her response to economic impoverishment. Her ability to name, to put into language her class subordination and therefore to transform her position um, uh, from uh, Michael Kraling's poor white woman living in Morgana, Mississippi into something else. While the discourse of the master polices the credibility of institutional narratives, the discourse of the university disseminates those narratives through educational, religious, legislative, legal, and economic channels. And in the space between these forces, Katie's subjectivity has crystallized. While some of the obedience that she shows to King originates in this prescribed legitimacy as a man, some of the deference she exhibits while she traces to her unquestioning respect for his socioeconomic rank. He descends from a regionally prominent family that gives its name to the city of McLean, and he, like many sons of Southern privilege, acquires an education in the law. That Katie luxuriates in the reflected glow of King's high social status, showered over her and many other women in the county, perhaps suggests why she volunteers so unreservedly all the detail that she does regarding her knowledge of him and Snowdy. Superficially, she confesses some he hesitancy to reveal what she knows, but I could almost bring myself to talk about it to a passerby that will never see her again or me either. But of course, she goes on comically to share because pleasure predicated on a veneration of the social hierarchy results from her elaboration of her experience at the third corner of one of King's many love triangles. Probably like many others, Katie accepts her exploitation because the university discourse to which she subscribes directs that she, that she should respect social superiors who allocate her a position well below King and his wife, a position marked by the role of the alienated worker churning butter to make a living. Has not the labor of her body been appropriated by someone else's discourse? Related evidence suggestive of class deference also comes in the form of the loyalty that Katie shows toward the locally endorsed view of Snowdy, the gentle daughter prosperous of lovely Mr. Eugene Hudson, Hudson, a storekeeper down at the crossroads past the courthouse. Gentle Snowdy, fathered by Eugene, a name well she associates with economic, religious and legal power in the area, commands lines of aggrandizement as a long suffering saint. Snowdy, who dressed for marriage whiter than your dreams, emerges in share of gold as a martyr, according to Peter Smith, a person whom institutional narratives filtered through Katie elevate into a paragon of wifely fidelity. That Katie contributes to this discourse and does not challenge its dominance among the women of Morgana suggests a concessionary and conservative class position. Rather than forming an alliance with Snowdy against the misogyny that King and others display, she comports with the university discourse that prescribes respect for social stratification and authorizes pleasure only in the forms that reinforce the class status quo and her own alienated place within it. Add race and Katie's likely minstrelizing of Pless Morgan to the gender and class directives to which she responds and that completes a summation of the context within which the process of her interpolation has occurred. While I have not time now to develop this further line of ethnic analysis, I hope to have shown here in a limited way how emerging of old and current theories about subjectivity and agency can help explain Walter's preoccupation with speaking bodies and what that key interest of hers may reveal about strategies for a more humane society in which, like Eric Fromm, people and not the production of things is the aim. 
Thank you. Join me in uh, thanking Steve for his paper. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my recommendation is that we hold question until after Sarah's paper and then um, you know, respond to both papers at once. So, so thank you. And uh, Sarah, it's, it's all up to you. Um, thank you, Steve. I share your interest in speaking bodies and I think you'll see that in this paper. Uh, can everybody hear me? Sound good? Okay. Um, so the title is Inside Out, The Dead Girl in Eudora Welty's Story, Clyde. In Eudora Welty's 1941 story, Clyde, Clyde Farr lived with her overbearing sister, despondent brother, and invalid father. Having fallen into financial ruin, her family members act their parts in a typical Gothic narrative, laced with hints of violence and accented with heavy doses of screaming and cursing. Clyde is the household drudge, as Anne Romines labels her, cooking and cleaning for siblings who respond with only complaints for her efforts. After Clyde dares to touch the face of a barber who comes into the house to shave her father, she panics and races outside to confront her time-worn visage in the water of a rain barrel. Horrified by what she sees, she commits suicide by plunging her head into the water. The story ends with Clyde's body positioned in a manner that can only be described as grotesque, with her poor ladylike black stocking legs upended and hung apart like a pair of tongs. Clyde's experience is one of eight submersions in water that I am tracing in a larger project on Welty's work. Women encounter water in moments of transition or coming of age in these stories, and Welty uses these encounters to rewrite what Margaret Atwood identifies as the drowning maiden character in literature. Atwood explains that this character is, quote, what happens if things become too much for you, often in connection to men and sex. Shakespeare's Ophelia is a prime example, and I'm going to sort of shorthand this uh, tradition today by using uh, Ophelia. After Hamlet rejects Ophelia, she drowns herself and her beautiful dead body becomes an object of longing and fascination in a tradition I label the dead girl fantasy. Like Ophelia, Clyde exhibits signs of madness, standing in the middle of a road in the rain, screaming at her neighbors and cursing to herself in the garden. Clyde's utterances to others like Ophelia's never reveal to those around her the real reasons for her anguish. After she touches the barber's face, they both respond only with a despairing cry and no one appears interested in discovering why. Clyde then turns to the rain barrel, which appears to be her friend to escape her society. Unlike Ophelia, however, Clyde's drowning is not beautiful in its tragedy. Her body is not bedecked in a flowing white dress nor bestrewn with flowers. Her death does not afford a male character the occasion to lament how fate has cheated him. Instead, the description of her body is repulsive and even non-human in the comparison to Tongs. Lois Welch contends that this ending is shock shocking, nearly risible. Some critics blame this shock on the narrator. Carol Ann Johnson, for example, argues that Welty's narrator switches from a stance close to Clyde throughout the story to an outward view at the end, providing that abrupt ending, a question-provoking ending in its comparison to tongs, a device most often used to grasp something too hot to touch. I want to think about this image of the body through the issue of point of view. If we attend closely to the point of view in the story, we can see both ugliness and beauty. Throughout the story, Welty uses the device of free and direct discourse which is when a narrator shares the perspective of one or more characters while maintaining the third person. While the narrator portrays Clyde at the end from a distance outside view as a body, that portrayal of her upended body contrasts with Clyde's own perspective shared in the paragraphs directly before. Although Clyde is unable to voice her thoughts aloud, the narrator through free and direct discourse gives them shape, puts them into words. 
From Clyde's perspective, the rain barrel bore a heavy, dark, penetrating fragrance like ice and flowers and the dew of night. Although Clyde recoils when seeing her own face reflected in the water, her answer is to act. Quote, she bent her angular body further, thrust her head into the barrel under the water, threw its glittering surface into the kind featureless death and held it there. The natural images of ice, flowers, and dew that draw Clyde to the water are the culmination of her quest to connect with nature. Clyde through the story seeks nature in the form of rain, wind, fire, sunlight, and finally the water in that rain barrel. A gentic and vibrant nature offers an alternative force to the societal forces that can script Clyde's existence, but it is a force too strong for her. Even so, the, Cly the beauty that Clyde sees in that glittering water paints a different ending picture than the outsider's mechanical portrait of her body. The difference between Clyde's own agency in thrusting her head intentionally under the water and the mistaken assumption that she had accidentally, quote, fallen forward into the barrel reveals that the outsider view is flawed. In rewriting the drowned main story, Welton not only speaks back to this problematic idolization of the dead girl as a beautiful fantasy, she also reveals through free and direct discourse the competing versions of her dead girl's story, a duel that brings to the forefront the question of how coming of age narratives are constructed. In the story Clyde, that construction, specifically the use of point of view, is more complex than critics have previously previously acknowledged. Although the narrator does switch from Clyde to an outside view in that final dramatic scene, that move is the last in an oscillating floating dance between various entities, including these five. One, a somewhat distanced singular narrator. Two, a narrator speaking in the collective voice of the town. Three, a narrator whose view narrows to the view of the ladies of the town. Four, a narrator giving shape and substance to Clyde's internal thoughts and feelings. And five, a narrator voicing the view of the barber, Mr. Bobo. These different entities clash with one another. For example, it is hard to parse whether Clyde's going into the garden to have her cursing fit is empowering to her. From Clyde's point of view, although the words at first horrified her, she finds that her throat eventually becomes relaxed and rested. However, the point of the view shifts in mid-paragraph and the narrator speaks in the collective voice of the town with knowledge gained through its gossip networks, quipping that Clyde, quote, was only imitating her older sister who used to go out in that same garden and curse in that same way. Is Clyde freeing herself? Are simply following a preset pattern. As one point of view morphs into another, distinguishing the origin of any one segment of language can be challenging. By analyzing who has possible access to each piece of information, I can identify roughly 13 shifts from one perspective to another in the story. These shifts complicate the depiction of Clyde because the reader is led in turns to be more or less sympathetic with her plight and because no one point of view is neutral or authoritative. Consequently, the story presents distinctly different versions of Clyde's character. The town sees her from the outside as a crazy old maid and a white Southern lady, while Clyde sees herself as a woman seeking meaningful connection. For example, in the opening scene, the narrator sh shares the collective town view of what happens when it storms. Although everyone else seeks cover, quote, Miss Clyde Farr stood still in the road. Drawing from the town's composite general knowledge, the narrator notes that Clyde usually came out of the old big house about this time in the afternoon, and they expected her to be run over the way she darted into the road. The townspeople see Clyde's actions as nonsensical. Although, although they surmise that in the past, Clyde pretended to run errands when she scurried about the town, now, quote, Clyde came for nothing. The community members, all sheltered in buildings, look out at the figure of Clyde alone in the road, that external body, and together conclude that she has no reason to be there. 
They do this because for them, Clyde plays the role of old maid, a Spencer who did not marry when she was younger and is now crazy, awkward, and frankly, ugly. Monica Miller notes that the community compares her to two different barnyard animals. They note how the emptiness of her arms, she's not carrying a package that would speak to an errand, makes her arms stick out from her sides. They notice how her absurd bonnet sags from the rain. Her ugliness marks her social position as lacking a husband and children, reflecting the town's values more than Clyde's actual bodily experience. The lady's assertion that Clyde's wits were all leaving her just the way her sisters had left her reveals that they placed Clyde in a prescribed role. She is an unmarried woman who has now gone crazy because apparently that is what old maids do. When the narrator later retells the scene from Clyde's perspective, the reader sees that her actions are motivated by a need for human connection. She stands in the street because she was contemplating the face of a child she had just seen. Clyde likes to study faces because she thinks the most profound, the most moving sight in the whole world must be a face. In wanting to look slowly and carefully at a face, Clyde sees her fellow citizens as individuals despite their collective and reductive perspective of her. She also, though, admittedly thinks that every face was one she'd never seen before in a town with a relatively small population. Clyde could either be a serious philosopher of the human condition or a forgetful woman failing to remember her neighbors, but the assumption that she came to town for nothing is clearly faulty. From the town's perspective, Clyde should also play the role of white Southern lady. Jen Williamson points out the town's name, Fars Jen, connects Clyde's family to the town's economic and social history. Williamson argues that the reference to the cotton gin and the town's naming of the family's house as, quote, the old big house, point to the family's past participation in the planta plantation cotton economy and utilization of slave labor. Identifying Clyde initially as Miss Clyde Farr, the narrator uses both a prefix Miss and her full name, establishing Clyde's social standing as a white woman. The Farr's wealth may, may have dissipated, but the ladies, when we get their view, still worry about Clyde's behavior. They fret about her clothes getting wet, and they try to coax her in out of the street, indicating that they expect her body to conform to their sense of decorum as ladies. Since Clyde does not seem concerned by the rain's effects, in fact, she uh, pursues nature, she remains exposed. And the town's only recourse when she will not fulfill the role of lady appropriately is to say she's lost her wits. When the narrator shifts to Clyde's view as she interacts with her sister Octavia and her brother Gerald inside the far house, the reader glimpses a further facet of Clyde's positioning by others as white Southern lady. White women were supposed to demonstrate the supposed moral structure of Southern plantation life by remaining sexually pure. Although the narrator does not enter the minds of Clyde's siblings, the reader hears what they both say to Clyde about how she has failed their expectations of this role. When Octavia greets Clyde, she complains that Clyde is late preparing the meal, accusing her of illicit behavior. Quote, you sneak away and not answer when I call you go off and wander about the streets, common, common. Although Octavia's insult of common might just be a comment on Clyde's not living up to the expectations of her social class, the references to sneaking and the streets hint at sexual promiscuity. After Clyde touches Mr. Bobo's face, the resulting loud chaos causes Gerald to insult Clyde's behavior. Quote, somebody was running past my room. I heard it. Where do you keep your men? Do you have to bring them home? From the outside view, whether Clyde is witless or promiscuous, she does not properly fulfill her community designated role as white Southern lady. By depicting Clyde's internal voice though, Welty rescripts the larger underlying narrative structure that typically leaves the dead girl's story unarticulated. Welty gives the body of the dead girl a voice before she dies. Clyde's thoughts are foggy and confused, admittedly, perhaps due to her violent and traumatic family life, but they nonetheless reveal a rebellious spirit 
trying to imagine a world beyond the constructed prison of the Gothic genre. After Octavia's insult about her common behavior, Clyde goes to the kitchen and lights the wood stove, drawing in the fire. This fire allows her to resume a dream she had when she saw the child's face. In Claudia's longing for human connection, she focuses on bodies, specifically two faces that call into question the community's positing of her as old maid and white southern lady. The first is a child's face, rosy like those flames, which contains an expression Claudia finds open, serene, trusting. When the ladies twice compare Claudia's, beha Claudia's behavior to her older sisters, it is as if Clyde is doomed to become just like the bitter, angry Octavia. But Clyde's dreams as a child suggest that at least at one time, she may have desired a path that included motherhood. Clyde also has memories of what, what Ruth Weston identifies as a forbidden love affair, a face that had looked back at her when she was young. She dimly remembers being in a sort of arbor and that she had laughed and leaned forward. Images of her family's faces, however, cut short her memories. The face of Octavia was thrust between, as well as the apoplectic face of her father, suggesting that if she had had a bow, he was driven away by her family. Although there was, quote, always an interruption when she tries to access this past, in her mind, she continues to construct a different Clyde than the old maid the town sees. This Clyde dares to fight her prescribed isolation in the present as well. When she touches Mr. Bobo's face, the sudden intimacy might make them both panic, but she may be correct in sensing his need for connection. He has continued to come to the house to shave Mr. James Farr, even though the initial trip would have been enough to satisfy simple morbid curiosity, and even though he is not getting paid. He continually vows to never go back, but he's drawn to the house anyway. Clyde answers his desperate meeting with a gesture of breathtaking gentleness in touching his face. Mr. Bobo had early imagined what one of those sisters would do if he made one move. But when Clyde initiates a move, his overreaction, the despairing cry and the fleeing, suggests she may have read him correctly. The interior the narrator helps to form shows the inklings of an autonomous self. Clyde's dream of a child, her vision of the face in the arbor, and her instinct to touch a human in desperate need, all revealed through the free and direct discourse, at the very least undermines the town's facile view of her as a body they can simply clothe with their constructions. More striking are Clyde's inner thoughts about race, reflected by the second face she contemplates. She is not the white southern lady the town or her family thinks she should be. The face she focuses on when pondering how profound a face can be is that of a black man who's referred to in the story only as Mr. Tom Bates' boy. The face comes to her in answer to the question of how eyes could secretly ask for still another unknown thing, connecting her vision here with her impulse earlier to touch the needy barber's face. In both instances, Clyde is attempting to answer a need and moving past her society's sense of decorum to explore things unknown. When she thinks of the mysterious smile of the old man who, saw peanut, who sold peanuts by the church gate, the visage of Mr. Tom Bates' boy materializes. His face seems for a moment to rest upon the iron door of the stove. Clyde sees what her town misses, while other people see his face as clean blank as a watermelon seed, finding nothing of interest. To Clyde, who observed grains of sand in his eyes and in his old lashes, he might have come out of the desert like an Egyptian. Her vision is incredibly intimate. Clyde is close enough to see fine grain details and fascinated enough to imagine him from an exotic place. Her close connection to Mr. Tom Bates' boy extends into the next morning when Clyde smiles, looking out of a secretly opened window when she sees him as he turned and looked at her through the window. Hannah Wells speculates that Mr. Tom Bates' boy might be the forbidden love in Clyde's past, a suggestion augmented by the need for secrecy in this scene and by her siblings' seemingly overwrought comments about her illicit behavior. 
because Clyde has had a relationship with a black man, she has indeed doubly crossed outside the lines of behavior appropriate for a white Southern lady. Even if the connection resides solely in Clyde's head, her fascination with this particular face reveals that her interest is not in maintaining a performance of whiteness, which yet again sets her apart from her community. For Clyde, Mr. Tom Bates' boy is associated with the church gate, the open window, and a bridge in the sunlight, all images of escape and release. Clyde seeks liberation from the narrative frames that constrain her, and through free and direct discourse, the, narrator, the narrative allows the reader to see a mind at work. And yet, she still ends up being the dead girl at the end, a body upended, exposed like a pair of tongs. After pondering the faces of her fellow citizens, Clyde sees her own face reflected in the water of the rain barrel, in the description of its ugliness lies Clyde's central problem, quote, the mouth is closed from any speech. As lively and rebellious as Clyde's internal thoughts may be, within the Southern Gothic framing, she has no way to express them aloud. Much like Edna Pontier and Kate Chopin's The Awakening, Clyde is a character in the wrong narrative and must exit to a different place. The glittering water is that place. She acts, but it kills her. Her community, however, continues to see her through their own frames, imagining her death as accidental, that of a crazy person, imagining she had fallen in the water, perhaps a subtle reference to her as a fallen woman, and finally imagining her body in death still clothed in stockings they deem ladylike. The inside, more complex story of her submersion in water is something the community would find too hot to touch. <clears throat> Unmute, we clap. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for this great paper about Clyde. Um, so we may begin our, our question and answer period. Um, I invite you to uh, just unmute yourselves and uh, ask questions and or write something into the chat and I will try to not miss what's in the chat. <laughs> and uh, so we, we may begin the, the questioning period. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, so I haven't really formulated this idea all that well. I'm just thinking about it as I'm hearing your papers. Um, could both of you guys talk a little bit more about I was struck by this phrase in your paper, um, Sarah, intimacy and distance. This idea that these speaking bodies, these bodies that signify, you know, they, they produce both an, a, an urge for intimacy and connection, but they also reify a sense of distance. Could you talk about, could you both talk about how you've noticed um, that weird connection, that weird linkage between intimacy and distance that you find with these body narratives in any, any, any part of the story of Clyde or any of the piece, um, Shower of Gold or anything else in Welty? Did everybody understand Donnie's question? Can yeah, you hear me? I could, okay. I could comment Thank a little you. bit um, mm -hmm. in Shower of Gold on the um, presentation of body intimacy. And, you know, of course, my paper <clears throat> zeroed in on Katie Rainey because <clears throat> I regard her as uh, maybe the most or one of the most um, clear examples in Shower of Gold of a character who um, lacks the kind of kinesthetic awareness that I was talking about, the sense of um, herself, her own body as her own possession. Um, and this limits her ability to, um, uh, to um, uh, emancipate herself. But there are other characters too, who, you know, I bring into contrast with with Katie, and those include um, characters like Virgie Rainey, 
her daughter, and um, perhaps most obviously, uh, Miss Eckert, who uh, we know um, in, enjoys one of the most um, conspicuously embodied moments in the whole of the, the Golden Apples when she um, performs at the piano during a uh, thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, this is a moment that uh, World T uh, uh, spends much time uh, detailing in the novel. And then also um, in, I don't think in the written version of One Writer's Beginnings, does she allude to that moment? Um, but in the, the spoken version, as I recall, I need to check this, um, in the spoken version, in the recording of her presentation at Harvard, she references that moment and reads from it. Um, and, um, you know, characters like Virgie and Miss Eckert are characters, uh, you know, in my view, because of their intimacy with their bodies, are subject to all kinds of social ostracism and persecution. Yeah. yeah, that moment you're talking about in the in the in and um uh in the story where she's playing the piano and she's playing very you know powerfully vigorously, you you know there's this weird kind of um, paradox where on one hand the the moment stills everyone and everyone is drawn into it, but it also alienates the girls from her. And it pushes them away from her, and it, and it makes her all the more an estranged figure to them. Um, and there's that wonderful line in the story where um, the wrong person is making this music. You know, this is come this 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 art is coming from the wrong life. Uh, I think something to that effect. Um, and then you know, you were talking in your in your about your piece, uh, Sarah, and and you mentioned how she's looking into the face of this black man. She's thinking about this black man's face, and she's looking into his face, and she's seeing this um, Egyptian exotic other space, this other place. So there's this weird kind of intimacy and, but also distancing um, that's happening at the same time. I thought that was really kind of interesting in both of your, in your presentations. I'm sorry, I missed out on the initial question, so I'm just catching up here. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just asking, you know, uh, what what did you think about those moments that you 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 kind of um, catalog in your paper? Um, those moments in which you have instances, those those instances where you have intimacy but also distance and, and the body signifies both at the same time. There's this weird tension, this weird tensity between closeness and wanting to be close. And you're, you're discussing how Clyde wants to individualize people. She wants to um, see um, people as not just a monolith, but as individuals, but it also you know, it provokes in her, um, whether she realizes it or not, a distancing effect where she pushes people away or she imagines uh, a kind of exoticism that creates an automatic distancing effect. Um, and so there's this weird tension between those two elements, I thought, between the, you know, the distance and the, and the closeness. So that's what was my original question and whether or not, um, um, I don't know, <laughs> whether or not you wanted to, whether you saw that, um, and whether you were going to do, do some more with that or if you saw that with other pieces and other characters. That's a really interesting um, thought and question, Donnie. I do think that there's a lot of tension um, in the story. Clyde at times seeks isolation. She wants to be out in the road in the rain, even though yeah. everyone's drawing her in, because I think she has been so harmed by certain kinds of human contact that she's going to go down the road of, of seeking agency through nature. You know, it's mm -hmm. the rain, it's not the people. Um, even the moment when she smiles because she sees Mr. Tom Bates boy's face, she's still inside and he's still outside. And so mm -hmm. 
We might guess that there may have been a connection in the past, but even if there were, there's still this, she's trapped in the house and he's going fishing. So yes, I think each time you get Clyde, when she's preparing everyone's meals in the kitchen, she's going to take them all up and she wants to feed the father. And Octavia says, no, you can't. Octavia is standing at the top of the stairs and Clyde's at the bottom. And so we constantly get Clyde wanting connection, but at the same time connection is often painful. Yeah, so there's a lot of tension, I think, back and mm -hmm. forth between those. In the larger paper, my argument is that she moves to nature as a way out of that, but she's mm -hmm. not strong enough for the nature mm -hmm. and it kills her. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'll add <clears throat> that um, Welty's story from Bride of the Innisfallen, No Place for You, My Love, might be um, seen as uh, the, a great example of the two characters who remain distanced but are in an intimate situation and resisting intimacy throughout the course of the story and imperviousness um, and their fight against it or to maintain it um, mm -hmm. is crucial. Yeah. 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 I think it's all over wealthy, actually. You know, my, one of my favorite lines in Delta Wedding, if not my favorite line, is um, uh, is when the main character says, is this still the Delta in here? You know, <laughs> when she's in the house in Marmion, and she's like, is this still the, is this still the Delta, Delta in here? And so you have that, that tension all telegraphed in one little line that says so much, yeah. Joanna, I also think that story is very interesting for the, the connection between speech and body that, that she was also pulling through because she says the point of view in No Place for You, My Love is floating in the air between the two characters. And so we just, we get this odd way in which she's also giving us the story of their connection, but also uh, the barrier between them. So I think the speech acts and the point of view are, are really interesting in that story as well. That go to what Steve was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, Steve, I, I have a question. I mean, if I think it is indeed such that Eudora Welty oftentimes embodies a social protest, you know, in characters, in possibly the kinetics. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think I was convinced that Katie Rainey is part of a master narrative that she enacts without possibly reflecting on it and is part of this, you know, yeah, part of this, like this, this narrative that actually turns her almost into an object or, or disallows her power, say. The fact that she dies at the end of the golden apples, do you think that wealthy is, I don't know, is, is that too bluntly a message that maybe her way of understanding, um, what, like, jouissance, desire, mastery, revenge, I'm not sure, is, is sort of coming to an end, or just just asking, where, where, where would you take it? Was Katie Rainey's death? Well, I mean, I don't really think that her death necessarily changes the analysis, you know, and the analysis mm -hmm. in this paper is that she is an almost completely interpolated individual that she subscribes to impose narratives of one kind or another, a couple of which I outlined in the paper. And that um, it may be that there's evidence elsewhere in the golden apples that shows that she's able to in some way overcome those narratives, change those narratives, edit, revise them in one way or another. But there doesn't seem to me in Share of Gold any evidence, you know, to reveal that. And that that part of that reflection that you that you mentioned is um, you know in line with the idea that that I that I was arguing for here, uh, in line with the idea that she lacks awareness of herself at the level of the body, that may give her that sense of uh, agency, that sense of individualism, and uh, other characters, um, one might point to in Welty, where that process seems to be underway, might include um, those two those two characters whom I mentioned, sister. From why I live at the PO, and the narrator from a, me a memory who 
I wouldn't regard as um, wholly, uh, you know, aware or alert to the significance of what possession of their own body may mean, but they, they seem as if they are, um, th there are flashes, maybe more than flashes of a sense that they um, think of themselves and their bodies as their own possessions. And that, that that in some way has, you know, given them some sort of a liberation. I don't know if that answered your question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Steve, I was interested in how you manage Plez um, and um, his uh, challenge to Katie and also the way in which she absorbs or doesn't absorb him. Uh, what do you think? How, how do you handle that? Well, I mean, the, the part that I left out here um, for time reasons was to do with uh, analyzing uh, players in the same way that I analyze the discussion or the handling of um, class and agenda. That is to uh, um, argue that in, in one form or another, she minstrelizes players and that, that that's that's another example of the way that she has just accepted at face value what her culture has taught her regarding ethnicity. And, um, you know, so, so basically that was the, the center of the analysis on players that in, you know, even his name suggests or indicates a name that has been made up for him, right? That, it, that, that, um, that, that we don't know his actual name. I mean, his name is taken to be players Morgan, but is that just part of uh, Katie's and the community's um, co-option of his body and th through the naming of him by the giving giving him a name that um, is not necessarily uh, his name at all it's just the name that they would prefer that he go by according to their assumptions thanks Sarah I wanted to say to you I, I was fascinated by your charting 13 shifts um, in the story and the helpfulness of your naming the shifts um, and I think this is so much an issue in teaching wealthy, uh, it's, it's, such a, it's, a, it's such a difficulty um, to track those, the shifts and changes in, in wealthy's work. Um, uh, I see you're muted, uh, uh, but um, uh, you wanna say a little bit about what you're finding as you look, as you trace this through uh, wealthy's uh, um, canon? a large question here. So, <laughs> let me start with Clyde. So I found in teaching Clyde and I found in reading the criticism on Clyde that too often readers go straight to the they, the corporate town view as the legitimate view because it seems to have more power as the they. And when you start really looking at the shifts and the way even in the middle of a paragraph she cuts off the they, I really think she's trying to get you to rethink that corporate town view. And that corporate town point of view, I think is something she's rewriting, playing off of. It comes from Hawthorne and Twain and Faulkner. I mean, there's this tradition in American literature of having this narrator that is the town, um, often looking at a female character who's crazy or weird or an old maid, especially in our Gothic tales. Um, and so I think that in using the free and direct discourse, she has a lot of power in all of her works to get into different views, but I think she does it to complicate the construction of the narrative. I think she's trying to make you constantly say, who's telling me this piece of information and do I trust it? And how does this piece of information go with this other piece of information? And so we end up with what I call sort of tonal complexity in that the tone keeps shifting and we don't know do we like this character? Do we not like this character? I find myself constantly asking that in Wealthy Works, by the way. Do I like this character? Do I not like this character? I think it's often because she's trying to get you to pay attention to the construction. Who is telling you this part? And that shifting between points of view, I think, gets us there. I think it's really um, uh, that we're talking about the idea of, um, of an unreliable chorus. Um, and um, that's that's fascinating and how very helpful. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, um, yeah, you really see that happening in June recital where everybody just accepts the idea that Miss Eckhart and Mr. System have a thing going on, <laughs> that they're related, they have this big relationship and they just couple them off. 
And there's a moment at the funeral. I was thinking about this when you're reading your paper, Sarah. There's a moment at the funeral where everybody just assumes that Miss Eckhart's um, display of grief has something to do with one thing or the other. And you see a real competition there and, and narrating that scene between Katie, who's, the, who's relating it, um, and, um, and this, this they that you're talking about. And so there's this real tension, this real um, tension between who's really in charge, who, who really has the authority here in this moment and who really knows what's going on. And, and Wealthy makes you question um, whether or not that, that, you know, whether or not, you know, we really know um, the, the nature of this relationship between Mr. System and, and Ms. Eckhart. She, she is another one, Donnie, the community wants so badly to type and construct a certain way with a certain narrative. You know, she's crazy old maid. And if they can just get her in that construction, then they've got her. And I think yeah. that wealthy keeps trying to yeah. get Yeah, just like Clyde. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether y'all heard my alarm went off in the middle of this. I'm sorry. Uh, we have one more question in the chat. Actually, it is from Jacob. Jacob, do you want to turn on your microphone and ask the question? It's for Steve. Sure. Yeah, I was just um, listening to... Can you all hear me? Or can you hear me? I hope. Yes. Um, my question is, is we when can you're hear. talking about the kind of compromise speech acts of Katie, it, it made me wonder at the end of with that moment with uh, King making that very silent a hideous howl uh, at Virgie. I was just wondering if there's any way we can make sense of that. And he's the guy that seems to be the the face of the master in Morgana. Mm -hmm. So is he too, is, is his language alienated? And I guess I can also add to Sarah, if she'd like to talk about this. I really like that connection to Ophelia. And I think to Hamlet at large, in, in the sense that Hamlet's a whole play about characters that are frustrated that they're caught in a revenge tragedy, that they're opting out of this genre. And I think that's exactly what Welty does over and over. And Clyde, that's a character frustrated with the genre she's being caught in, uh, so on and so forth throughout Welty. So I think you could do a lot with that uh, through line. Um, yeah, I am working on the uh the connection between these, uh, this theory of kinesthetic awareness and how it affects men in Welty. Uh, you know, I'm arguing here that uh, Katie is lacking that quality. Uh, it doesn't seem to be an evidence that some of Welty's other women show it in more quantity. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, may, it may be that, um, you know, that in King, you have a character who has an excess of that uh, quality that it is he he feels his body too much that it that it you know he he seeks his sort of the repetition of his body in lots in as many ways as as he possibly can you know the think about all of the the children who are scattered all over you know Morgana um, it may be that his howl that you mentioned his scream is a protest against a, a woman so conspicuously as embodied as Virgie. And that really that how represents in one way or another his desire to dump her in a barrel like Clyde, for, for example, you know, to, 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 to make the body inert, to kill the body in the same way that the, um, um, you know, I mentioned Gloria in losing battles in, in my paper, in the same way that the uh, uh, the the Beecham Renfro uh, clan uh, gather to um, stop Gloria speaking. Right, they ran the watermelon chunks down her throat. That is, they are attempting to stop her embodiment, to erase it in some way, destroy it. Uh, and um, so, you know, um, the the voice of the master as it comes through. In, uh, in King, uh, you know, is registering the same complaint against who is possibly his daughter, you know, that he feels that he's entitled to, um, uh, you know, regard, regard his body in the, in the way that he does, but she, as a woman, 
uh, is precluded from that. Yeah, I think there's a lot to say about the kind of claiming of uh, literary voice through male authors. When you talked about that part of your paper, I was reminded of this kind of memorable quote, I think from either Philip Roth or John Updike, and he describes the voice of the author as something that begins at around the back of the knees uh, and reaches well around the head. And so we hear in that the male author kind of not only embodying, but claiming language as, as something he owns. So I think there's something there. Well, in some ways I hate to end up on the body of the male, um, but this is where we're at, um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out of our time. So I'd like to remind everyone that our next ALA session is on wealthy media and modernism. And it is on Friday, July 9th from 10 to 11.20 a.m. And it is participants are uh, Michael Picard, Katie Fry, Donnie and Kevin, uh, Rebecca Mark. And I think Harriet is also involved in some way. Um, I also like to remind everybody that our Faulkner and Joachim Potofa conference this year is going to be online. It is, um, it is taking place July 18th to, through 21st. And the topic, as you all know, is Faulkner Wealthy, right? So a wonderful constellation. I invite everybody to join us. And some of y'all who are represented on the screen are actually keynote speakers and present and so on. So I look very much forward um, to seeing this group again. And um, yeah. And are there any final questions or, or anything? Um, Annette, um, yeah. the, the next um, session for ALA, July 9th? For well, ALA, July, July 9th. Oh, OK. A month from yes. now. Oh, wow. That, okay. that, that, that session is not being recorded, but it's happening at, at, the, confer at the conference. Leslie Petty will be in a room um, uh, doing our video from our Zoom from there. Uh, and that's the reason why we have that date. Okay. Um, I was so to, act, to access that, you have to register for ALA. Is that no, correct? No. Uh, there is a, um, there are very reduced uh, registrations uh, for ALA this year, but um, uh, they've also put out a statement that um, uh, people who are uh, connecting by Zoom uh, do not need to register. Uh, but um, uh, but it, you'll find it there, and I'll I'll I will also I'll send it out to everyone as well in an email. Okay. Thank you very much, Harriet. Thank you all for coming. I will stop the recording now. If you want to hang, we can still talk without being recorded. Yes. I have a question for you about about 